long time ago, I was waiting to take a bus to college at the Port Authority bus terminal in New York. There was a crowd of about 20 people waiting, and I was farthest away from the curb. There were a couple of guys near the curb talking, and as the bus pulled up, everyone could see that the bus's side mirror was about to whack one of the guys in the back of the head. So I waited a moment, figuring someone near him was going to pull him away. But everyone just stared at what was about to happen. So I pushed through the crowd, and I yanked him away. Well, whatever it was that allowed me to ignore the bystander effect that day probably has played a role in allowing me to pay attention to climate change and to come talk to you today about the three things that keep me engaged about it and hopefully will engage you as well. The three things are how climate change could whack us all, why we all ignore it, and how we can fix climate change for free. So I'm talking to you today as a father and as a citizen. I'm not a politician or a scientist, though I've studied climate change for many years and even co-authored a peer-reviewed paper on global warming. My personal tipping point on climate change came in the early 1990s when I read a magazine article about Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish Nobel Prize-winning scientist that noted that we were beginning to burn fossil fuels and that this would increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Well, based on the work of other scientists in the 1800s, he knew this would lead to a warmer world. So, as an academic exercise, he wrote a paper in 1896 where he calculated how much the world would warm if we doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. While he got it about right, he thought a warmer world would be a good thing. After all, he lived in Sweden. <laughs> so also in that magazine article I read, it talked about how we were now putting vast amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, currently about 30 billion tons a year, and how this could end up changing our climate. So after that, I started reading about global warming and talking to scientists. I had co-founded a venture capital company in 1997, and we had success investing in internet and enterprise software companies. But because of my and my business partner's growing concern about global warming, in 2005, we switched all our new investments to companies that address climate change and the challenges of limited natural resources. Now, while most people weren't paying attention to global warming in the 1990s, we've known that this climate bus is coming at us for a really long time. Here's a short clip from the Bell Laboratory Science Series in 1958. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather were not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. So, so climate change is not, a science, is not a scientific controversy. Every major scientific academy in the world agrees. In 2003, a heat wave in Europe that has been directly linked to global warming killed over 50,000 people. And in 2010, another heat wave linked to global warming, this time in Russia, caused global food prices to spike and helped trigger the Arab Spring. And of course, here 
in Texas and the Midwest and now in California, extreme heat waves and droughts have had and are having severe economic impacts. A few months ago, NASA announced that we have officially crossed a climate tipping point. They said that the major West Antarctic ice sheets are collapsing and their loss is, quote, unstoppable. This is going to lead to 10 feet of sea level rise over the next few hundred years. And when combined with sea level rise from other sources, such as the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, this is going to result in 15 feet of sea level rise in the next 100 to 300 years. This means that the bottom third of Florida and many island nations and coastal cities are going to be submerged. This is a slow moving tipping point, but it's still a tipping point. We can reduce our emissions and slow down sea level rise, but we can't stop it. And there are many other climate tipping points, potential climate tipping points, that could lead to a climate system spiraling out of control of our children. So it really makes sense to address the problem now and try to stop that. So one of the biggest impacts this century is going to be extreme drought and famine. This is from a very recent study that looks at the probabilities of a 10-year mega drought if we continue business as usual emissions. It shows that Texas has about a 75% chance and California about a 50% chance. And of course, the chances of a five-year drought are much higher. And there's even a small chance of a 35-year mega drought. So it really makes sense to take actions now to prevent these kinds of risks. So one thing that most people don't understand is that CO2 is unlike all other kinds of pollution. For example, if you have a river that's polluted by industrial runoff, you can eventually shut down the factory causing the pollution and take some other steps. And then in a little while, the water will be clean enough to go fishing and swimming again. But CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So things don't get better when you finally stop emitting it. That's why it is so important for us to immediately begin reducing global emissions. If we start now, the outcome will be very different than if we start 10 years from now. Now, we've known about the dangers of climate change for many decades, and yet we've done virtually nothing to stop it. Why is that? Well, there's lots of reasons, but one of them is that our brains are programmed to focus on potential threats only if they have certain characteristics. We focus on threats that have one or more threat indicators. So imagine you're standing on the savanna and a lion shows up in front of you. And let's compare that to the threat of climate change. So we respond to threats that are visible. There's the lion. Climate change is invisible. In fact, it's a beautiful day today. We respond to threats that have historical precedence. The lion ate your brother last week, so now you know to watch out for lions. Uh, climate change hasn't happened before in human memory. We respond to threats that are immediate. There's the lion, you have to act right now. Climate change is drawn out over years, decades, even centuries. Direct personal impacts. The lion is coming after you. Climate change might hurt your children or other people. Simple causality. The lion is going to eat you, and you're going to be dead. Very simple. <laughs> With climate change, it involves parts per million, methane, ice sheet instability, and all this kind of stuff that's kind of complicated. Caused by an enemy. In this case, the lion. But climate change is caused by all of us. Now, to see how important this one is, imagine that we find out tomorrow that all the excess CO2 in the world is being released by Al-Qaeda in order to destabilize the climate. Now, ask yourself, would we then do something about it? Of course we would. Now, even though we have these limitations, we can overcome them. And besides, climate change is becoming more visible and more immediate every day. Now, there's other ways that we ignore climate change. One of them is that we think of it as a distant environmental problem. I tell people that climate change is an environmental problem like World War II was an environmental problem. 
World War II was an enormous environmental problem, but people also realized that it was a national security problem, an economic problem, a health problem, a human rights problem, and even a threat to their own families. Society also conspires to suppress the discussion of climate change. As someone who talks about climate change a lot, I can vouch for this. In fact, someone once said that talking about climate change is like flatulence at a cocktail party. <laughs> and like the crowd waiting for the bus, we wait for someone else to act. But this bus is too big. We all need to act. Here's a, here's a cartoon that summarizes our psychological approach to climate change. <laughs> so, we need to urgently and dramatically lower fossil fuel emissions. The good news is there's a way to do it that almost everybody will like, and it will create millions of jobs, grow the economy, and cut emissions in half. It's called fee and dividend. A fee and dividend policy is actually very simple. We put a fee on the CO2 content of fossil fuels, and the fossil fuel companies pay that fee at the well, mine, or port of entry. And, and so there's not a lot of places where you need to collect the money. And the fee starts out small, maybe around $10 a ton of CO2, which translates to about 10 cents on a gallon of gasoline. And then the fee rises $10 or so every year for 10 years. So this is going to raise the price of fuel, food, and everything else that depends on fossil fuels. So you might not be too happy about that, but just wait. We then take all of the money collected, every single penny, and we dividend it out to every legal resident on an equal basis. So you and Bill Gates get the same check every month. Now, this is going to give you money not only to pay the higher prices, but also to change your light bulbs to LEDs, to insulate your house, to buy a fuel-efficient car and other things. So you and everyone else will lower their carbon footprint, which, of course, is the goal of the policy. But, you might ask, sounds great for me, but this will raise the price of American products and make our exports less competitive. And besides, it won't really matter if we lower our emissions, if China and India keep increasing theirs. And you're right. And that's why there's a second part to fee and dividend. We're going to put a border duty or a tariff on goods coming from countries that don't have their own price on CO2. So China, which is actually planning to put a price on CO2 in a couple of years, will be able to continue to export to us normally. But let's say that Australia doesn't put a price on CO2. So the products they export to us will be subject to a tariff based on their estimated carbon footprint. So Australia and all other countries that don't have a price on CO2 will be faced with the following choice. Do I want to send lots of money to the United States, or do I want to keep it myself? Well, they're all going to choose to keep it themselves by putting a price on CO2. This will accelerate the adoption of a global carbon fee much faster than the failed attempts at the United Nations to get countries to do the right thing. So as I mentioned, the price on CO2 is going to raise the price of fossil fuels so people will use less, and they'll also adopt alternatives such as renewable energy. And it turns out that wealthy people use a lot more CO2 than the average person, Plus, the government uses a lot of CO2 and doesn't get a dividend. So it turns out that most people will earn more money on the dividend than they pay in higher prices. So unlike other plans, the poor and the middle class will do better under this policy. And a price on CO2 will spur so much investment and innovation that it will create a renaissance in clean energy technology. A recent economic study shows that a fee and dividend policy will decrease emissions by 52% in 20 years and create 2.8 million jobs over that same time period. And 
increase GDP by $1.4 trillion. Hey, that's better than free. It will also save 227,000 lives in the United States because of reduced fossil fuel pollution. Now, you might say, because of our broken, dysfunctional political system, there's no chance that any action on climate change will happen. Well, like the tipping point of the legalization of gay marriage, action on climate change is going to go from impossible to inevitable without ever passing through probable. It will happen. But the question is, will it happen before we cross more climate tipping points? The answer to that is up to all of us. If we don't act quickly, the climate bus is going to whack all our children in the head. That's why you need to push through the crowd now and learn about climate change and talk to your family, friends, colleagues, and elected leaders. Don't wait for others. Demand action. Together, we can make it happen. Thanks a lot.